that's May 2nd, uh, uh, 2020. And um, uh, this is a discussion of the first chapter of uh, Pascal Boyer's book, Religion Explained. It's basically an evolutionary origins of religious thought. And I'm just talking about the first chapter here. Um, uh, this is just a, a gathering of um, uh, things I've been talking about the whole week. The chapter's name is What is the Origin? And uh, basically it's, um, there are um, There is an old-fashioned way that anthropologists looked at religion and um, basically um, uh, Boyer, Pascal Boyer, the author of the book, is um, he's bringing them up, noticing them, and then dismissing them for their shortcomings because he wants to present something entirely different. And the first uh, scenarios he calls origin scenarios, which are religion is explained, it's about explaining. Religion is about providing comfort. Uh, religion is about social order. And uh, religion is about cognitive illusion. Um, the idea that people created religion to explain puzzling natural phenomenon. Um, or that religion um, explanations make uh, morality less unbearable, or um, it lays anxiety and uh, makes for a comfortable world. Religion uh, holds society together, and religion is superstitious, and uh, they'll believe anything. Okay, so that's religion as an illusion. Um, the, uh, one of the problems, of course, is, is that the things that origin stories and, um, and all, all of these particular, um, is, is that there is actually a lot more diversity in them than there is uh, universality. Um, that there are origin stories, pretty much everybody has one, but that those are entirely different is quite um, is quite the thing. Um, so um, he basically says the because you can't um, universalize a lot of these origin stories, uh, it it just isn't uh, a useful um, category a way to um, look at religion, at least from an anthropological point of view. Um, now, that's over-summarizing, I suppose, but um, um, uh, and basically what he says here about religion as explanation the urge to explain the universe is not the origin of religion. The need to explain particular occurrences seems to lead to strangely Baroque constructions. You cannot um, explain religious concepts if you do not describe how they are used by individual minds. And if you want to look at it in a, an entirely different way, religious concepts are probably influenced by the way the brain's um, inference systems produce explanations without our being aware of it. Um, now, the, he, he also goes on to dismiss the idea of religion as comfort. And he says here, um, religious concepts do not always provide uh, reassurance or comfort. As a matter of fact, they're often quite uh, um, uh, guilt-producing. Uh, deliverance from morality is not quite the universal longing that we, um, or mortality, excuse me, not morality, uh, 
is not the universal longing we all assume. In other words, not everybody cares about whether uh, we're going to die or not. Religious concepts are indeed connected to human emotional systems, which are connected to life-threatening circumstances. Well, that's just... And looking at it a different way, our emotional programs are an aspect of our evolutionary heritage, which may explain how they affect religious concepts. So evolution has produced the mind that we have, the brain that we have, and in that there are um, structures that um, in the brain that, that um, change the way we think about religion in our own lives. Um, uh, now, religion, morality, and society. He, he dismisses this one, too. Religion cannot be explained by the need to keep society together or to preserve morality because these needs do not create um, institutions. Interesting, okay. Um, social interaction and morality are indeed crucial to how we acquire religion and how it influences people's behavior. It is, in other words, important, but looking at it from a different way, the study of social mind uh, can show us why people have particular expectations about social life and morality and how these expectations are connected to their supernatural concepts. So it does, it is important but it's it's not uh, really it's not the way to go after the problem. It just doesn't. Um, you can't quantify it very well with that approach. And finally, um, um, religion as an illusion, or religion uh, from a reason point of view. The sleep of reason is no explanation for religion as it is. There are many possible. Um, unsupported claims and only a few religious themes. Okay, so it's, um, belief is not just a passive acceptance of what others say. People relax their standards because some thoughts become plausible, not the other way around. Some thoughts become plausible. It's not that they are plausible and so they relax. They relax because they're plausible. A different angle. We should uh, understand what makes human minds so selective in uh, what supernatural claims they think are, pos are plausible. Okay, so he goes on here to really talk about, he, he dismisses the, the old ways, uh, anthropological ways of looking at religion, and he says, you know, what's important here is the, the way the brain works and how it is structured. And so he posits that uh, um, Richard Dawkins' idea of culture as memes, M-E-M-E-S, meme. A meme is a um, uh, copy me experience, and those are everywhere, but... Um, a copy me experience might just be a popular song and you hear it once and you can sing it. Um, uh, and uh, years later, it'll you'll be waking up and it'll pop into your mind. Um, it's memorable, um, but it, it passes some particular threshold. And a meme, uh, culture as meme, uh, he uses the analogy uh, between genes and um, um, and memes. Uh, genes are replicated, and so they produce uh, a genome. Matter matter of fact, uh, for each of us, the genome, our own genome, exists in each cell. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. Now, each cell does not express the whole genome. It uh, if it's a liver cell, it'll express, express liver cell ness, um, or lung ness, or kidney ness, or skin ness, or whatever. Um, uh, but what happens with memes is is that they are heard or taken in in some way, 
um, they are sort of processed and then they are transmitted to other people. And some memes uh, seem to come in and, and, and without further ado become part of us and others um, we completely change. Um, and the example he uses here is uh, since uh, culture as meme comes from Richard Dawkins, he posits two memes that Richard Dawkins express. One is culture as memes, and it was pretty much accepted within a very short time by pretty much everybody in the social sciences and elsewhere. Um, and what it means, cultural, is that uh, we tend to describe culture in terms of groups of similarities, but the reality is that, that um, each individual arrives at those um, uh, arrives at their particular position in culture um, singularly. Um, in other words, there is no body of culture. There are a group of people who share the same similarities, but we have fallen into the mistake of describing culture in terms of the large similarities rather than looking at the process of the individual in dealing with um, becoming part of the culture. Um, and uh, so uh, the second meme that uh, Richard Dawkins um, expressed was one called the selfish gene. But everybody got that wrong. Um, everybody took it in and changed it in their minds. The meme came in the idea was simple. It was that genes replicate and they cannot do anything else. They are selfishly what they are. They cannot be something else. Um, so it has nothing to do with selfishness, but everybody heard selfish and they thought, oh, there is a gene for selfishness. Well, no, there isn't, probably. Uh, but, um, but everybody liked it. So they, they misheard and they reprocessed it within themselves the, the wrong idea. I've even heard Bill Maher talk about the selfish gene in a way that, that Richard Dawkins never meant, it had nothing to do with being selfish. Um, but that's what we, we do. We take in memes and we process them. And there are structures in our brain that find something likely or not likely. And these are what um, Boyer and others call the inference system. We infer from it. Uh, and what do we infer? Well, uh, within the system, uh, within our structure, there are uh, templates and there are concepts. So, for instance, uh, animal is a template. We all have a whole group of things that are animals that we can recognize as animals. They are concepts, the particular animals like a badger or a squirrel or a human being. Um, some would argue that humans are different, but they're not, that we're, we're, we're animals too. Um, the, the point is, is that um, we have this category of animal. There's something we infer so, for instance, if we know how a particular animal reproduces, so, for instance, a chicken lays eggs, and that's how uh, we get new chickens, or a walrus, these are the examples that uh, Boyer used, uh, a walrus gives live birth. If we know that one walrus gives live birth, then we know that all walri, or walruses, whichever, uh, they basically do the same thing. Um, uh, that the entire species does one thing. We infer. In other words, oftentimes when we run into a meme, it doesn't give us a lot of information, but we infer a lot of it from our templates. And we create a concept of walrus and a concept of chicken and, um, and other things. Um, we even have other names for it. If we've had Spanish, we know that chicken is pollo. Um, so uh, 
you know, that, that's just the complication of that particular concept. Well, the same thing exists for religion as well. There are templates for religion and there are concepts. Um, and uh, when we hear something about a religion, one that's not our own and one that we're not familiar with, um, we will run it through our own templates and we will decide whether we think it's a valid experience or not. It's, uh, we will either create a concept of it's a religion or it's not. Well, uh, at least not for us. So the, the approach that uh, Boyer uses is the approach of social sciences in general nowadays is the, um, the idea of memory. Um, Templates are one of the devices that allow minds to reach uh, similar representations without having to um, having a perfect channel to download. In other words, when a meme, which is a, a copy me kind of program, we process it. We don't. Every human being that hears that, that experiences it, processes it. It doesn't. Um, it isn't copied like a copy machine or a computer. It is uh, chewed through. And some things we chew through and come out with the same answer that everybody else has, and others we chew through and come up with our own bizarre take on it. Um, and sometimes everybody chews through it and comes up with the same bizarre um, idea. Um, Anyway, um, okay, so, um, he, he indicates, uh, that his approach to the mind, uh, creates a lot of questions about the religious concepts in terms of this uh, approach of the mind. So these are questions, uh, puzzlements of questions, he says. Uh, why do people have religion more or less everywhere? Why does it come in different forms? Are, are there any common forms, uh, features? Why does religion matter so much to people's lives. Why are there several religions rather than just one? Uh, why does religion um, prescribe rituals? Why are the rituals the way they are? Um, and so on and so forth. He, there's a bunch of questions that come from this particular... Um, and he says basically there is no magic bullet. Um, uh, but there is a quantifiable way of thinking about religious concepts that makes social science into the science part of it. Um, there are even mathematical ways of looking at it, or algorithms, if you will, um, that you can look at a particular um, um, group of concepts and come up with something. Um, the point is, uh, the, the second chapter, he's going to go on and he says what supernatural concepts are like. So he's going to look at the um, what the supernatural construct concepts are, but remember concepts come from templates, so we'll be getting some idea of the templates from which religious life uh, evolves in an anthropological way of thinking about it. As I say, this is quantifiable, and so that's why he he likes. Uh, that's why he uses it as a social science. Um, it's also a, a very handy way to think about uh, our religious life. Um, those of us who uh, are actively religious, and even those who who are 
actively agnostic, and most of us are agnostic most of the time, I would say, um, realistically. Um, at least I say that as a Christian minister, uh, having experienced an awful lot of agnosticism uh, in my practice of religion. Anyway, um, well, we'll go on to the second chapter, and I will summarize it in one of these short um, uh, things. I hope this has been um, helpful, and I hope it's uh, been true to what Boyer was really trying to do.